Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Tracy Defoe. She's an adult education consultant. She's a researcher specializing in workplace education. And for parts of the last 10 years, she's been puzzling over the challenges of participation and leadership in continuous improvement. So that's going to really be our theme here today, some perspectives and, and different ways of thinking about um, continuous improvement. So Tracy has taught communication, writing, teamwork, cross-cultural communication, as well as teaching methods to adults in colleges, universities, and the workplace. She's a regular consultant to business, labor, and government, and she's an advocate for plain language and clear design. So I'm going to do my best to use clear language, and we can learn from you, I'm sure. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for joining us, Tracy. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm really glad to be here. Um, Tracy's website, by the way, is www thelearningfactor.ca, which gives you a little hint as to where she's uh, connecting in from today. Where where, where are you, Tracy? Uh, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, though I have to tell you, a lot of people think that CA stands for California. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it could. I mean, it's different. I've lived there. It's different, but no, it's still the same. <laughs> yes. yeah, it's still the same I'm country. in Canada. That's right. <laughs> um. <laughs> But there is you, you've done a lot of um, speaking and work and collaborating with people here uh, down here in the states, right? Yeah, sure, you bet. Yeah. So um, there's a lot to talk about here today, and you know, you, you've got um, you know, I think a pretty unique background and uh, expertise when it comes to um, education for uh, adults, and there's a lot we can learn here. But I like to always kind of start with the origin story, if you sure. will. Like for for you, Tracy, what was the context of? sort of the when, where, why, and how you, you got introduced to continuous improvement? Well, my my lean origin story, I guess, in a as, as short as I can tell it, because I can tell it as a long story too. I was teaching at the University of British Columbia. My At the time I was teaching English as a second language and also writing and reading and some of that stuff that you mentioned. Um, and a factory here in the suburbs called the university and said they had a problem they couldn't solve. And did they have anybody who they thought could do that? And mm -hmm. as it happened, um, I'm, part of my job was special program design. So I <laughs> I went out and uh, met the people at the factory. It was a it was at that time a pretty it was big for the area. It was about a hundred people, you know, maybe twenty engineers at the front and eighty people in the back making stuff. They make um, at that time they made boat steering. Now they make boat steering and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. And um, they had been trying for about two years to get the Ford Q1 designation. So they realized that it might be that they were not good at teaching it. And remember that, oh, I didn't tell you this, but all the factory uh, pretty much smoked variations of Chinese, Cantonese, oh. Mandarin, whatever. Mm -hmm. But Vancouver is a very multicultural place, and everybody in the right. office pretty much spoke English. So there was some translating supervisors. I'm sure you've been in those places. Mm -hmm. So I went out and uh, did some research, interviewed some people without a translator, <laughs> yeah. and came up with a teaching plan. And in nine weeks, um, we had the Ford Quality designation. Yeah, oh, great. So they realized that if nine weeks of teaching uh, could solve a problem that they've been working on for two years, maybe they suck at teaching and learning. And mm -hmm. so I, I still have them as a client, actually, uh, many almost 30 years later. And uh, that's how I learned Lean. They said, you know, we're also trying to learn this Toyota production system stuff. Um, maybe you could. So I, they sent me on all the courses that they had. They were part of a consortia. And I came back and said, I thought we could improve those courses a lot if we took the push out of them. So, mm. you know, a lot of uh, concepts in Lean translate very nicely to adult education. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that's just one by one, one piece flow. Mm. All mm -hmm. people are different and maybe individual learning plans, a good idea, yeah. but also um, you can waste a lot of time and energy with push. So, you know, if I go in with 200 slides and I run that lesson on 5S all day, no matter what you say, yeah. and it takes the same amount of time, whether I'm alone or you're in the room, that's push. Yeah. So I said to them, I thought I could turn it around to pull. And uh, that was the challenge I took up was to, to take some of the waste out of their lean training. And um, and that was the my lean origin story. So yeah. my big strength as a, as a person who helps companies is I do not know how to run your company. Mm -hmm. I do not know how to run your machines. Yeah. <laughs> so when I have to ask questions or go back to basics, it's pretty easy for me because I actually could not do that job. So, okay. <laughs> so it's a big piece. And then from there, um, 
so the the lean teaching, the lean course that I worked out was based on questions. And a hundred percent, what I decided to do was to teach the concepts of lean, mm-hmm. low value added, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, things like, what do we mean by customer? Like that's a concept yeah. as much as it is anything else. Mm-hmm. So my course was based on concepts. And as it happened some time into my career there, maybe I'd been there five years or something. Um, some guy from the University of Michigan came out to teach uh, standard work. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, you're you're telling people to ask questions and not give answers. And that's what this guy, Mike Roth, is telling yeah. people. So that is how I uh, got... Um, uh, introduced, let's say, to the cata, to the to the infant cata community at the time, and yeah. have been, and I realized right away that what Mike Rother was doing with his work and research into Toyota management practices was a lot of exploring good adult learning and get mm-hmm. good adult learning practice, yeah. which translates into pretty good management. Yeah, yeah. So going back to that situation in in that company. Um, was was like kind of you know framing the problem statement or diagnosing more specifically if if they weren't real good at teaching if they yes. sucked at teaching was 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 there more to it than the push versus pull or was that really kind of the main cause well they were telling the people yeah. what to do as they probably did in the factory yeah but what you really have to do is to figure out um where people are at right yeah. current condition like where where are they at where do you need them to go? <laughs> yeah. And and what's the learning path in between? What what support do they need? And um, what are their what are their barriers and obstacles? There are a few people at the at the plant. For this is really funny. Manufacturing plants are awesome. Such a good learning environment mm-hmm. because there's so many actual real life things to work on. Yeah. And one of the weirder ones. So I don't know how you if this the that pro- quality program worked just the way most of them do, and that you had to be able to survive an audit. So mm-hmm. somebody you didn't know had to be able to walk up to people and ask them, uh, what do you do if there's a problem? Or how do you know this part is good? Or how do you interface with the safety system or something? And most people either couldn't understand the question or they couldn't give a good answer. Mm-hmm. And in how, in teaching them, I discovered a whole bunch of those very, very competent machinists and machine operators and stuff. Um, they could only read English text if it was an Arial caps font, hmm. because that's what engineering diagrams are written in. Huh. So they were extreme visual learners. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's, you know, I've been trying to get them to write uh, upper and lower case on engineering diagrams for quite some time. It's much easier to read. Yeah. But anyway, so there's one little quirk. And then another one was they were really used to going through a few translating people. So they actually never tried <laughs> to talk to anybody. Hmm. So I plumbed out what English they knew. Uh, we pumped up what English they needed. Their mm-hmm. math was all really good, no surprise. Mm-hmm. So they could already, um, they kept charts and things like that. They just had to be able to explain the chart. Mm-hmm. And um, if once you get down to very specific tasks, uh, you know, it's teachable. Yeah. 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 Um, that That whole idea of, as you put it, understanding the current condition and understanding what somebody knows. That reminds me of um, the training within industry approach, which I believe starts with that whole, like, you know, you you, you don't, if, if you're doing one-on-one instruction, especially, you can tailor the instruction. That's why that's good. So, right? One by yeah. one is what will work the best. Yeah. Yeah. So then how, like the challenge, and this, this is tough, I don't know if you've gotten, you, if you have tips on, addressing this if, if you're teaching a class or giving a talk inevitably there's maybe a bell curve distribution in the room yeah. of like especially you go to conferences like somebody may have just been thrown into a lean role and they can spell yes. the word and they haven't learned anything yet and then you might have someone in the room who's been doing it longer than you and you wish well maybe they should be up here teaching because i could yes. be learning from them you know and so it's like do you, do you try to Meet in the you you can't teach the person who's brand new because you might bore everyone else to death. But oh, like how, yes, if smart. it can't if it can't be one to one, how do you navigate that? Okay, so um, when I was doing uh, teacher instruction class, like when I was learning, one of my favorite mentors had a T-shirt, and on his T-shirt it said "Set up and get out of the way." Mm-hmm. So your job in your mixed level group is to give them a task where each one can operate at the level of their edge of what they know. So Mm -hmm. we call that in in education, um, 
the zone of proximal development. So, so most people don't learn way past what they already know. They learn at the edge of what they already know. And um, I always show my hand and say, and most people have a bumpy profile and they really like mm -hmm. to learn where they're good at things. And they mm -hmm. don't really like to learn where they're not good at things. So you do group work. So you say, um, well, here's, okay, get it down to the absolute simplest. That auditor's coming up and you have to greet somebody, mm -hmm. right? Some people are ready to say, hi, my name is Tracy and I'm the education person here. Other people are just going to go, hello, and nothing else, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we can all work on greetings at the level of our ability. Mm -hmm. Assign a task, doesn't matter what it is, talk at your table, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and um, and then you get to observe the, the people and see who's quiet, who's whatever. And what I usually do is I redo the groups. Oh. You gotta decide. Mm -hmm. Do you want all the people at the same level together? Do you want mixed level groups? In which case you go up to the most able person and you say, look, I know, um, you know, you know a lot about this. How about you help facilitate your group and make sure everybody talks because usually yeah. they're going to talk a lot. So the mixed level group thing, like get, assigning a task, observing people, and then taking another step is probably the best strategy for that. Mm -hmm. The other ones are, um, for a conference, be sure you have your visuals really support what you're saying, mm -hmm. but don't have your words on the screen. Right. And then um, use the same word for e all the time for everything. I used to teach university writing, okay? And we mm -hmm. teach people not to use the same word maybe twice mm -hmm. on a page. Right, to mix it up. A little. Yeah, come yeah. on, you got vocabulary. Let's see it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually have taught the course Technical Writing for Engineers. And that is why, you know, as punishment, I teach, I now teach clear language because we actually taught people to never refer to themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it has been found kind of stuff. Right. And so if you use consistently use the same word for the same thing, mm -hmm. people who are really new will catch on quickly. Sure. And, and if you mix it up and, you know, we talked about uh, where people are at now, but if I started calling that current condition or current state or operating pattern or status quo, or I could use a lot of words sure. now, everybody who's is wondering if this is all the same thing. Yeah. Well, that's one of the easy ways to increase communication Pick a term, stick with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not to get too sidetracked on this, but I'm 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 trying to finish up a book I've been writing about learning from mistakes, and huh. um, yeah, there's there's a grammar tool, and it's quite often suggesting like maybe you should use the word error or you know mix it up, and I'm, well, not, oh. you know, like the word I'm using very specifically for specific mistake. reason is mistake, and so yes. sure that that word's going to appear a lot. Yeah, that those grammar tools are a difficult crutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you about a tool that I use when I'm editing, but maybe not on the, oh, sure, put in a plug. Perfect it. Perfect it is what editors perfected. use. Oh, perfect okay. it. Perfect and, it. Okay. Yes, it will go past what Grammarly or your word thing will do. And you can mm -hmm. tell it, I like this word. And one of the cool things it'll tell you is you used a word, but you already defined it before. Did you want to mm -hmm. define it again? Or, hey, last time you said lean, um, you put capitals or you know it helps finds all the inconsistencies that wow. are really hard to find by yourself okay so, i'll have to look at that because i i have used we have a sale on <laughs> <laughs> okay. do you have a promo code or i don't i know but i just i get emails i happen to notice they had a sale yeah okay well we'll, we'll check that out because well we, we, you know when it comes to clear communicating um whether it's in writing or or you know verbally, um, that's that's important. I want to come back to that point in in, in a bit, but I was going to ask you when it comes back to to teaching and instructional design and adult learning. Mm -hmm. So I think one other question is, um, and I think this is addressed in in TWI as well. Like, how much can somebody really absorb? Mm -hmm. in less a than, less session? than you think, and less yeah, than they think, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and look how many workshops are designed with a default of like, here's an eight hour workshop. And yeah, uh, I'm against that. Actually, yeah. I think COVID was great for adult learning because yeah. we all got down to the 45 minute Zoom that was free <laughs> for a while. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. And then people paid for Zoom and now they can go longer. But I, I have an absolute max at 90 minutes. Mm. Um, and if we are OK, so when I started teaching, we used to say. Uh, 15 minutes. So four times an hour, you have to change your activity mm. to keep people's attention, right? Yes. So the change of activity could just be 
um, write for yourself, talk to your neighbor, get in a group of four, stand up and write on the whiteboard, you know, write, what, that that would count. And even changing the what we're looking at. So look at the front, now look at the back, those things reset. Now, nobody's got 15 minutes of anyone's attention, right? Like if you're lucky, you're going to get like seven minutes of somebody's mm-hmm. attention, maybe three minutes. So we have to up the pace of the change in yeah. what we're doing. One really great way people do that is to tell a story. So narrative is fantastic for memory. Yep. Narrative is great. So you start to tell a story, then you do your lesson thing, and then you pick the story up again. Mm. And if you if you break the story up with, with cliffhangers, if you can. I actually think with TWI, that might be pretty easy to do because there's always a story of the product or the story mm. of the customer or the story of um, the people who make it. Yeah. Yeah. So, gosh, that makes me think we're about 15 minutes in the episode. Yeah, sorry. How do we, how do we <laughs> another whole up? podcast just on oh, education no, no. tips. I haven't yeah, even talked yeah. about reading yet. Yeah. Reading is the most abused, uh, probably, uh, skill. You know, the most abused skill we assume people can read, and then we make it super hard for them with all of our choices of fonts, white mm-hmm. space, uh, capitals. Um, all, I, t- I teach a little, I frequently teach a little course on that. Because I think when people learn about layout and how mm-hmm. people read layout, they can actually improve quickly compared to trying to learn editing or word choice or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going I'm to mix it up a little bit sure. here. And yeah, I, wasn't critici- I wasn't criticizing you for I was just saying, okay, it's been 15 minutes. Let's mix it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit more for those who are listening and uh, not watching on YouTube. They can't see your kata pin. That, oh, yeah, that you're wearing. So tell, yeah. tell us a little bit more about that and like, you know, the, the symbolism of, of the brain well, the, I'm, lifting I'm, weights I'm, and how, yes, how, how can we develop? The yeah. weightlifting brain was the symbol for Toyota Kata. I don't know when they did it, probably early on. And I suspect, you know, uh, Mike Rother and Mark Rosenthal and Tilo Schwartz probably did it on a napkin in a bar, but I don't <laughs> have any idea on the origin of that. Yeah. So I spend uh, most of my time these days um, in sleep in the Toyota Cat Methods. I, I am, of course, as we all are, a learner, a coach, and a second coach. I actually spend most of my afternoons as a second coach. Mm. Um, and I think the, the idea is that you uh, – this one Mike did for me. This one is heart, hand – right? It's the brain. Oh, the oh you're right. Yes. It's a heart. Yeah. And the brain. It's a heart yeah. and a hand. Yeah. And that's because I was always talking about, yeah, sure. You have behaviors, you do this stuff, you think this stuff, you'll get stronger, but uh, it doesn't mean much if you can't engage people's feelings. Mm. So I was always the one talking about feelings. How do you feel with your coach? Uh-huh. How do you feel at your storyboard? And um, so anyways, I'm big on, on imp- trying to make the manager accountable for the tone and the feelings mm-hmm. of the coaching cycle too. So I don't know if people know what it is, but Toyota Kata is a, um, a pattern for mostly managers, but for people who are leading other people to learn to, um, to practice a, a very specific structured method in order to have the outcome of improving their scientific thinking and solving tough problems that they didn't know that they could solve. So I, over the course of COVID, um, actually opt my activities in that area because uh, the Zoom gave me the world uh, and, and quite a few time zones at the same time. So I yeah. started a couple of, a CATA school, uh, CATA school Cascadia, and we're probably the most active CATA school on the planet. I don't know. I think we might be. Yeah. Uh, and, and a CATA school isn't really a school. It's just a bunch of people who get together to do stuff. And, um, and also, of course, the category Girl Geeks um, yeah. started that during COVID, too, which is a bunch of women helping women learn that thing. So, yeah. well, and you pointed behind you, who, who is that? What you're the, the character the creature behind you? <laughs> yes, this is I don't know Yeti. I don't know if you can read his pin. <laughs> I don't know Yeti. And he is our mascot. He's the mascot of Cat School Cascadia. And he has a really fun origin story. I actually did a little talk about him at our at our meetup not too long ago. We were on a Zoom call, as we are every Friday, and um, we were talking about the power of um, adding the word yet to I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of coaches have struggle, or maybe other people, in drawing out um, learning from people. What did you learn? What did you, you know, how did that go? And they just don't yeah. reflect much. Yeah. So anyway, if you're lucky, you can hit the place, the edge of what you know, or what Mike Rother calls the threshold of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And somebody will say, 
I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And so mm-hmm. we were talking about as a coach, how awesome it is if you can get the word yet in there. I don't yeah. know yet, right. right? Which is that growth mindset, the idea that mm-hmm. you could learn it. Right. And Mark Rosenthal said, um, he, he kind of started laughing and said, hey, we should, um, we should have a mascot and it should be a Yeti. <laughs> and we'll call him I don't know Yeti. Yeah. And so Gemma Jones was on the call. I'm just looking to see if I have a, the original picture. I don't have it handy. So she sketched one. We put it on T-shirts. We put yeah. it on mugs. This isn't it. And then um, a couple of them were made. And I was looking for a low price point consumer version. This is a 1899 Amazon Yeti. <laughs> that. Uh, and then I we printed the buttons. So if anybody gets there. And I, a Yeti of any kind they want to be, and I don't know Yeti, and they get in touch with Caddis Gold Cascadia, I could send them a button. And yeah. uh, I think there's, I don't know, I personally have distributed over 100 I don't know Yeti buttons. So mm-hmm. um, that whoever, this thing, this one is is uh, made by um, Aurora World, and it's a baby toy. Mm-hmm. Very cuddly. <laughs> and yeah. if you, you'll often see them now in people's Zoom or even on factory floors. Yeah. Um, and I was second coaching somebody the other day who's in a pretty heavy duty factory with like CNC machines and stuff. And the, uh, so the coach is there and the learner's there and they're saying, well, how are you, you know, what do you expect to happen? And he said, I don't know. And then the coach yeah. went, hey, you said it. And then he, what they do in their factory is if <laughs> someone says, I don't know, they chuck around the Yeti. They yeah. throw it back and forth between each other, like a dad throwing babies yeah. up in the air. Because there's like a 40 foot ceiling in this building. <laughs> this thing so you're throwing went, it higher than a baby. but It yeah. went to the moon and back. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, the Yeti, we've had so much fun in 2022 with the Yeti. Mm-hmm. And I think for me also that shows kind of like my general spirit in terms of doing this stuff is it should be fun. Yeah. And if we're going to do stuff in community, if we can have fun while we do it, then I think it it attracts the right learning vibe to our to our teaching. We are not super serious. You know, yeah. we are yeah. having fun. But I mean, um, I've, I've heard um, and it's funny, you know, some of these things you brought bring up. I've heard from um, for, former Toyota people I've learned from, like, I think, of Pascal Dennis um, from yes. kind of, uh, Ontario. Also Canadian. Yes. yes. <laughs> And um, he would he would also he will always talk about having to um, you know engage hearts and minds. Okay. Ideas straight from Toyota, and then um, you know Pascal would 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 often talk about trying to have what he called a light touch of like trying to have bring some humor or lightness because you know he, his experience was that it it helps facilitate learning. You know, it's like he's not doing stand up comedy when he's teaching lean. No, but, but you got to bring your stress how, down. Yeah. Yeah. So talk, tell yeah, me yeah. more about that then, of making it fun and the benefit of that. Well, the first of all, it's a vulnerable place, right? If you want to, if you are actually being taught, or if if someone has decided you need to learn something, mm-hmm. <laughs> so if it wasn't you, that's like a super vulnerable place. And then if we're asking you to like write down what you think or you know, or or chart data or something, um. In lots of work and learning environments, being wrong is kind of a risk, right? Like right. you're risking being reprimanded or you're risking whatever. Actually, Mark Rosenthal says his his Japanese sensei used to hit him on the back of the head with a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never had that kind of teacher and I'm not yeah. that kind of teacher. Right. We shouldn't now. No. Yeah. But um, so the positive reinforcement, it's totally just, you know, if you if you are if you're stressed out, your cortisol levels go high, you're not imprinting new brain patterns right Mm -hmm. yeah and anybody on the who listens to this who has kids may have heard their kids teacher say because teachers are huge on brain science now like it's basically all we talk about is brain science (laughs) and and so uh, the things you do at the same time um, end up in your brain and if you repeat them they really end up as pathways and like automatic reactions and so we always say what fires together wires together Mm. if you get two synapses firing at the same time there will be a connection. And if the connection could be pleasant, mm-hmm. I like reading, you know, mm. like I always say, what is the ability to read without, um, without like a love of reading? Yeah. You know, like wh- what have you got? You've got a technical skill that you will use as little as possible. Right. Right. And then the other part is that learning, you know, hum- people are meant to be in social groups. You know, we are comfortable, we are safer. So a social group that can provide the environment where it's safe to to be 
to learn, I think that's that's optimal. Yeah. Like you yeah. can't learn with your guard up. Right. Yeah. And we've got to provide another way of framing that would be um, creating conditions for psychological safety. Absolutely. Yeah. Safe to say, I don't know. Safe to say, wait, I don't understand. Safe to say, I tried something and oh, it didn't work. Well, okay. Within a kata cycle, that's great. But it's probably hard to introduce some of that if you're trying to bring it into a workplace that has pretty low psychological safety. Some of the things we might assume of like, well, it's okay to say, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And some workplaces still that, that might not be okay. No. And what I see all the time is um, because my, you know, my primary job is I, I observe people, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, people are giving you what they, what they receive. So, you know, it's their dad, it's their first teacher, it's the way that they were managed. You know, that's why uh, Mike Rother sometimes says your first job is your most important job because mm -hmm. that's where you're going to start to learn work culture. Mm -hmm. So you should pick a job in the in the sort of like an aspirational culture, like the, the way that you wish to spend your work life. Yeah. But if you came uh, under someone who is hypocritical or micromanaging you or made you feel scared to make a mistake, mm -hmm. you are going to pass that on. Mm -hmm. It's like... Um, pretty hard to purge that out of yourself. Yeah. So it, it makes me think of, um, you know, growth mindset, which seems to be emphasized a lot in education yes. today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not, not to go back into my origin story, but, you know, I've, I've talked to you before of um, that first job out of college was at a General Motors factory that was classic, old, yeah. bad, ugly. People didn't right. say toxic culture or toxic workplace, but it was. Um I still have some wounds or scars from that. I, I mean, I think I've been able to move past it because maybe it was only a year. And then we got, you know, the one I call yep. the good plant manager who had the <laughs> new me experience. And so maybe it wasn't a long enough exposure to be unrecoverable. But, mm -hmm. um, but I can think of environments where, you know, let's say you have a workplace that has fairly high psychological safety, then someone else new comes in they might not feel safe because they weren't safe in their yes. previous workplaces. And you can't expect them to say, well, it's safe here. Feel safe. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You have to earn it every time. And yeah. actually, you know, that's instructors know that everyone can never come back. Right. Like a, no one comes to me um, under mandate. So I have to earn the return every time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other thing about that is, um, like my first job was at the university. So this is, you know, what kind of baby boomer I am. I got hired back at my learning place and they taught me how to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. But in the, my first job, every Friday at lunch, the whole group gathered and we talked about what we were learning and what we were struggling with and people shared stuff. Mm -hmm. So I sort of thought making your own stuff and talking about it was really normal. Uh -huh. And I super value that experience because it turned me into a uh, applied researcher from mm -hmm. day one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do see people all the time too, who, I mean, it, it might be work culture. It might be home culture. Mm -hmm. It might be your school, school culture. And so it's, if you can notice it, you can probably, um, mitigate it or at least try to be different. And actually the kata is that it's the pattern to do that because you are completely restricted in what you could say and do if you're the leadership role, if you're in the coach role. Yeah. Yeah, or at least as, as my, and I'm not a, a, a kata expert um, or you know um, kata geek, but my understanding. Work, of it I'm is, working on you, Mark. I'm yeah, going to work on yeah. you. <laughs> I'm not opposed to it, but we'll we'll come back and talk about jargon and language uh, in a bit. But uh, and you know what we anchor ourselves in. But um, where was I going with that? Um, Actually, derailed, be, okay. Go. Did you get there? Or no. I derailed myself. Um. <laughs> so I would love to segue just from that safety bit to mm -hmm. something that DeAndre Wardell and I are working on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is yeah, that okay? Yeah. yeah. So um, I was DeAndre's first coach and she was the first person I ever coached remotely. And she tells that story all the time. She so gives you credit a lot. I do us. not. I know people think I'm great and it's all DeAndre. It's so good. So you don't, what you, everyone really needs is one person who will tell everybody that mm -hmm. you're an awesome person. Yeah. But in fact, we've, we've developed, we've, we've looked back a little bit at DeAndre's experience in that role and about safety mm -hmm. because, uh, and we've made a workshop that's is about how you can, kind of operationalize or, or get some traction on your equity and engagement 
goals, mm-hmm. which a lot of a lot of organizations now have these diversity. Uh, what is it? Diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. I think is the last part. Yeah. Uh, goals, but they don't know how to do them, and so they they just don't reach them. And we tell the story about our first um, coaching experience and how it can, in fact, create a safe space for somebody who never felt safe at work. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. it's partly because it takes. Um, I, I've been joking about you know, your uh, middle-aged white manager, and it tells him to only say these things. Yeah. And basically, by restricting what people say, you create more space for listening, but also for the other person. Uh, yeah. And then we actually uh, give them the heart and brain thing and say, hey, you know, pay attention to this person and what's going on for them. And so we we are preparing for, um, for Catacon 9, a half-a-day workshop on that, but we actually want to turn it into a bigger learning because we found that so many people were like, I had no idea what to do. And this has telling me what to do. Yeah. And um, and they kind of walk out with a little plan, whether they use the cat or not, of how they could get some traction on their diversity goals for managers, which I think is like, wow, if I get to if I get to participate in that, like that's a legacy. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Good. And so I got back on track. You mentioned um, you know, the the card and the the, the limited yeah. words. And so what I was going to ask was my understanding of it is that there are the quote unquote starter kata questions yes. and for some period of time thou shall not deviate until mm-hmm. you get to a point where then it becomes okay to customize or deviate or so with that or other things we're taught like is there a general benefit this happens sometimes with 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 um lean coaches of like, okay no i'm going to show you this very rigid way yes until you've you've mastered it and then you can start customizing instead of trying to make customize it, make it our own from the very beginning. Can you kind of talk through some of that process or how do you decide when you can shift from very limiting starter kata to your own version of that or your own version of something else? Um, I think, okay, so I have two answers to that. First mm-hmm. answer is uh, you will decide too soon because mm-hmm. everyone thinks they're way better at what they're doing <laughs> than what they are. So that's, that's like simple fact. Dunning-Kruger <laughs> effect, right? <laughs> Yes, that's right. Yes. The only the first rule is you don't know that you're in the club, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why we have this concept, what we call a second coach, but it's really just a, a mentor for the coach. Mm-hmm. And um, we talk about, uh, so we don't even want you to change the words because we want you to use to shut down your habit of what you want, which is to give your own idea, Right. You yeah. want to say, let me coach you. Here's the six ways I've done this before. And uh, none of them apply to this industry, but I still think they would work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think the idea that you have a starter kata is exactly like um, hold your hand a certain way. You know, people say that like, you know, we're going to do this for a long time before we throw a baseball because you mm-hmm. got to get both arms up, etc. And I think the the idea, and I'm not going to use the Japanese words because I don't speak Japanese. Yeah. I'm not Japanese, but there's this concept of structured pattern practice mm-hmm. until you have the muscle memory and the neural pathways to do something. And those are usually physical activities, but they also apply to speaking activities. And yeah. in lots of ways, if you're standing up, the kata coaching can be a physical activity. But um so you you follow the pattern until not just you have it memorized or something, but until it is completely second nature to you. Yeah. And then the deviation might be uh, a variation. I like to think of it as dancing. You know, I don't watch Dancing with the Stars, but I know people who do. Yeah. So you know, how do we know you're doing a waltz? And you know, how do we know that's not a tango? Yeah. That you there's just, certain you know, rules. Yeah. There's rules, right? And so. Um, Tilo Schwartz, who's one of my, I work with Tilo Schwartz. We do the master class together. Tilo, he abbreviated the card. He dropped two of my, my I know, but he's a uh, master. Uh, so, yeah. you know, you eventually, um, you know, you can, if you've got control of all of those things and you can, and you make it look easy, you can find your own path. But I would say for like most Americans and Canadians think they can do this in a month. Mm. And uh, most people I would say are probably realistically four to six months from being able to coach even with practice. Yeah. And then mastery, 
I don't know. I mean, I've been doing this more than 10 years now. Yeah. I feel like I kind of know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but when you put me back and I work on my own problem and I have a coach, like this actually surprised someone the other day. I I make mistakes, of course, because now you're into my brain, my assumptions, my jumping to conclusions. Right. And things like that. So the um when you can produce a good quality in a learner. So it's sort of like, I think this is how martial arts work, but I don't do martial arts either. But, you know, it isn't so much, can you do this thing? It's like, who was your, who is your teacher? Who taught mm. you, right? Who you, taught hear that you? In, you hear that in lean circles sometimes. Yeah. Well, because it's a pedigree, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. And so um, when you have produced enough people, when you brought them through their own challenges uh, and you feel like you have, you know, and you can demonstrate that you have a very good control of all of these basics. And by the way, there's a ton of them, right? Like right now I'm coaching somebody who's coaching his first person through a process analysis of initial current condition, studying a, a moving line. Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts. And he, I'm like, this is going to take two weeks. Mm. They're like two weeks. I'm like, maybe three, like just mm. accept it. We need yeah. to know where we are. Right. Sure. And so, but so he's kind of revisiting things from the other side. So I've done this as a learner. Oh, now I got to do it as a coach. I can't, I, I need to figure out what he's doing. It's, it's quite a shift. And then when am I a coach that doesn't need the training wheels? Yeah. Right. That's a long time. So I think um, I would tell people to err on the side of too long that mm -hmm. rather than too right. short. Yeah. Although if you have a community and help, but that's one of the things we do with our cat schools. Every Friday, people call in and tell us what they're working on, and then we can help each other. I think if you had that safety net of other people, we are mm -hmm. sure you can accelerate that. I have a huge advantage in that I know I don't know how to do the process. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I don't give advice on how to set up your CNC machine. Right. You're not on, the other give hand, the <laughs> on the other hand, I've been around manufacturing for so long, I can usually ask good questions. Mm -hmm. So then as a second coach, you, I mean, you, you're, you're trying, you're also trying to, you, you know, the kata process. So you're, yes. you're, is it hard to sometimes not jump in with advice or are you trying oh to coach, God, Mark, coach through questions? <laughs> I turn off my microphone and I turn uh -huh. off my camera so yeah, they can't yeah. see me go, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to. Do that. <laughs> no, right. no, no. Uh, once in a while, um, I will send a private message uh, to a coach if we're on a Zoom where you can do that. Today I was on Zoom, Teams and Google Meets and <laughs> Google Meets won't let you do that. Yeah. Uh, had a co had a coach skip an entire question the other day, and at the end, later on, she realized it. And I told her, if you're going to skip a question, the only question I don't want you to ever skip is, "What did you learn?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, if 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 you skip something that's otherwise okay, we'll get it tomorrow. And that's yeah. the other relentless thing I think about this learning is it recognizes short cycles every day yeah. or even twice a day. You're not going to do this with uh, three days, eight hours with an expert once every quarter or once a year, which is more likely how people used to try to approach things. Right. So then, I mean, it, what, what I hear you saying is it's um, because look, I mean, it, no, it, it, it's not like a, a potential mistake in healthcare where somebody could die if someone skips a question. You could yeah, jump in and deal. intervene or... Let the mistake Let happen and then reflect and, and help them realize after the fact what happened, what was the impact of that. Yeah, right. and, and we have a um we have a pokey oak for that. We have a way to prevent the error. Yeah. <laughs> which is that you move your thumb with the question and then you look down and see where you are. So yeah. I taught I taught that person that. But you if they never need to learn that, like they never make the mistake, I don't take time. Let's push if I teach them all the things before they need them right mm -hmm. and so i think also that um now i forgot lost my things i had a really good thing to tell you about learning that i've forgotten but anyway it's the every day every day little bit little bit and right. it's no big deal we're coming back tomorrow and it really suits the workplace because it's no big deal we're coming back tomorrow yeah when i first learned about the kata and i'm just going to say this because people um i actually thought it that it worked like that the secret sauce was that your boss listened to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I used to say to people, when's the last time your boss came down and listened to you for 15 minutes? 
Like just listen to you, forget asking right. questions, right? Yeah, like, so I actually thought it was the relationship thing and the idea that you were being heard and stuff mm -hmm. that was producing all these results. Yeah. And then when I actually, and I also thought people would say, if I asked you, what's your challenge? And I asked you that yesterday, that you would say to me, dude, I told you yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually thought that would happen. Like there'd be a thought bubble that said, nothing has changed since our last conversation. Yeah. But if you're at work, a whole bunch happened in this eight hours, right? No matter when right. it is. Um, and what actually happened to me when I, when I had that experience was I didn't feel like you're wasting my time. We talked about this. I actually thought, cool, we're on the same page. Like, wow, this is happening. So I think there's a lot of um, dopamine. There's a lot of pleasure yeah. that comes out of many, many parts of this that turn it into um, really uh, intelligent learning, like good mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. Yeah. And so th there's that feeling um, of like, so, you know, if, I, I imagine it could be a powerfully emotional moment if they are really being heard, being listened to you know, for the, for the first time. And, you know, I, I appreciate that you said the more definitive being heard. Cause I, I think it's a mistake. Sometimes I hear people say, I want people to feel like they were heard. I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. Like <laughs> it's more of a Yoda thing. Like you are heard yeah. or not heard. I mean, <laughs> but there, I mean, there is the feeling that uh, you could say, well, I want them to feel good because they are being heard, but sometimes yeah. it almost, you know, you, you, you hear people wanting to kind of create the impression instead yes. of actually learning. Yeah, and if you can fake that, right, then you're really good. Yeah, well, the, I always think, because I used to teach a course on understanding your culture. <laughs> I haven't taught it in a while, because I, but um, I used to tell people that everyone wants respect and trust, right? right? Everybody wants respect and trust. Yes. So when you listen to people, they usually feel respected. So it can be a real foundation towards having respect in your workforce that people listen. But then when you listen to people and you don't gossip about them, you don't tell anybody, right? And you give them the opportunity to like, say, uh, take a tiny step and try an idea, yeah. then they, they know that you trust them and they can trust you. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things built in here that um, a lot of things in adult education principles, but also a lot of things in, in this approach to improvement uh, that engender that kind of learning culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, you know, back to the idea of jargon um, versus yes. plain language. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the same question could apply to the word Kaizen, which I had been introduced to long before the, the other K word, Kata. Yes, me and, too. And, oh, oh, I'm sorry? Me too. I, I, Gamba Kaizen is one of my favorite books. Yeah. 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 And, in, and so, you know, you wonder... Um, does that word, does using the word, the Japanese word, having to translate it, um, there's probably pros and cons. Does it help? You know, same question about kata. Mm -hmm. If it hit, if it were called something different or like, does that jargon kind of the, pull someone in like, huh, that sounds, well, that's, I don't know what that is. Tell me more yeah. as opposed to using a word that people might feel like they already do know. Yes. Well, it's good if it's a word you, if you already know it and you know it from martial arts and it means pattern to learn exactly in order to gain a skill mm -hmm. then that's good um the thing we uh kaizen i think is in the regular english dictionary now like it has become part of our language and whether it's positively connotated you know like that i'm not i can't speak to that really sure. um i think if mike rother had the do back he might not call it kata uh, yeah. I know he wouldn't have called it Toyota Kata because the publisher mm. decided to call it Toyota Kata. Yeah. But the original title of his research book was um, Beyond What We Can See. Mm -hmm. So getting past the tools. Um, the thing, one of the things I like about it is uh, it got us away from problem solving as our objective. Mm. So one of the research projects, back when I was teaching Lean all the time, uh, you know, I got to the part where you're supposed to teach problem solving methods and problem solving tools. Right. So I did what I always did. I went out on the floor and I tried to collect stories. And I went up to, I don't know, 35 people and asked them if they could tell me a problem solving story or a story in which they solved the problem. And I had very few takers on mm -hmm. problem solving because it sounds definitive. Right. Solve. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's gone. Yeah. And yeah. nobody wanted to go on the record of having absolutely solved the problem. I found one 
Uh, and it was a place, it was a bit of a historic one, but this place they used to match fit parts, right? Mm -hmm. So they would machine them and then they would measure them to like uh, a tenth of a thou or something. And they'd have boxes of, you know, 5.1251, 5.2152. And they had to be exact or else they would leak. Yeah. And, and there were three guys, uh, a lathe operator, a CNC guy, a uh, technician. They worked for a long time until they could hold the tolerance. And then mm -hmm. once they could hold the tolerance, any two pieces would fit. And it immediately had like a million dollar effect, of course, in their production. So yeah. um, that was the only people willing to own a solved problem. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of incremental improvement or practice is quite freeing for people. Yeah. You don't have to kill the elephant you know you don't have to sure. find the biggest piece of game and hunt it down and have yeah. it never ever come back i think so that's uh hal Froelich, who's one of my my mentors and somebody i coached with for a while who we lost last year hal used to say who wants problems nobody but challenges if i can mm -hmm. give you yeah. a, a challenge that you're going to meet you know you might i might be can get more engagement on that yeah so yeah that's an interesting framing to think through problem solving and that's why i think you know, in lean, we tend not to use the word solution. We say countermeasure. Yeah. Um, because that, a solution is, leads to yeah. solved. As but countermeasure is just not a sexy term. It's you clunky. Yeah. 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 Um, as an English word, it's clunky. But, um, you know, if you go back to origins of, you know, uh, Kaizen means continuous improvement. You think of PDSA cycles mm -hmm. and the emphasis of cycles. cycles See, a lot yes. of that, was, you know, I think was already there in in kaizen and and so then this is part of my own learning journey and i'll i'll admit to having maybe just you know i i struggled at first to see how kata was different than kaizen i'm like mm -hmm. well i i that's a different word okay but i already yeah. I, I have kaizen and that works for me and yeah, yeah. i'll admit to like i was curious about kata but i didn't really dive into it now and then once i gave my, uh, myself the opportunity to learn mm -hmm. and not be so stubborn <laughs> um I'm like, okay, well, the kata mindset and process does bring something very different and some different things Yes, mm -hmm. to the continuous improvement process, if we want to call it that instead of the problem solving. Well, I, among other things, it, it brings you the little bit of effort every day and right. a way to be continuous because most Kaizen is extremely intermittent. Well, so that that's a whole different question about the word kaizen, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Oh, I yes, think of, of course, yeah. I think of you know kaizens and you know uh, my book with Joe Schwartz, healthcare kaizen, is about the small daily yes, yeah. habits, incremental improvement cycles going upward. My pet peeve, jargon wise, is when I hear people say um, we did X number oh, of kaizens kaizen? when they yeah, what yeah. they really mean is kaizen events, and I'm like, I, yes. I try to be a stickler of like a Kaizen event is one form of Kaizen. Right. But if it's a Kaizen event, you, it's harder to say, but I'm always like, oh, just say Kaizen event <laughs> because so that when, is sporadic and that causes problems. You know, when somebody's in that culture of uh, intermittent improvement involving yeah. many people that ends up with a list of what to do, the Kaizen Oof. newspaper, what yeah. we tell people now is um, instead of doing that, uh, you see your event time or your down your time when you're all together as um a series of of kata coaching cycles and end with a storyboard so that monday morning when the group has gone back to work that whoever the people who actually work there are they're not left with a list of to do's they're right. left with the right. list of target conditions uh or and obstacles and things to continue to learn about their process that is manageable enough that they can do it themselves yeah so there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind, you know, ka Kaizen events, you know, I think people would say the point is to have action during the week or however long the event is. Yeah. It's a doing event. Right. Um, where you might say a Kaizen event, I'll say it, this is judgmental and too uh, yeah. uh, definitive, but a Kaizen event done wrong has nothing but like, you know, observing and talking and whatever. And then all the action is in the follow-up plan. I think a lot of people would say, well, that's not how a Kaizen event is supposed to be, mm -hmm. but that happens or that evolves. Yeah. Is there a variation of, of Kata that could kind of go off 
the track of what it's supposed to be. Do you see places where they say we're doing kata and you're like, oh, oh that's, that, that's gotten off track. Like what, what yeah. are some of the ways people get in, off track? In, in both of the communities that I'm, you know, the women's group and, oh, that's what I was going to tell you before about the women's group. Now the moment is gone. But in Kata Girl Geeks, uh, we get refugees from bad coaching. Mm. <laughs> people who, uh, you know, like lots of people now, I think, have uh, dabbled in kata, but never been coached, uh-huh. right? And we tell people, you know, you got to be a learner and you got to be a learner long enough that you get it, like you get what this is about. So if they have been, um, they've had, they've been told they had to do kata, but their coach was unskilled or not quite mm-hmm. where they needed to be, um, it's been a very unpleasant experience. And the place where many, many coaches go wrong um lean consultant coaches or lean continuous improvement manager coaches is that they don't get the magic of um, figuring out where you are now and how this process or whatever is operating. How do you want it to operate? Not just what outcome do you want, Mm -hmm. right? But how do you want it to look? Like what's the cycle? How should it be? And so they confuse target condition, which Mike teaches in his uh, practice guide with target. Yeah. So they just nail a number on that side of the Uh, board. Right. And I spoke to, I was second coaching a woman who had been coached previously for most of a year by somebody and her coach made her pursue a target condition for months when it was mm-hmm. clear she was never going to get there. And what you're supposed to do is hit the date, reflect on what you learned from not being able to hit the target condition sure. <laughs> and, <Yes>. and <laughs> take a new feed on the mountain, right? Just take a new path. And, um, by wanting by kind of like whipping somebody to get the number you're missing mm-hmm. the whole point of right. the activity that's one and the other one is i think a lot of people go wrong in scoping like right at the beginning scoping the challenge mm-hmm. or figuring out like if if I, no matter what my job is i'm not if i'm not ceo i can't just run around and get everything yeah. all the pieces all the chess pieces on the board that will make this challenge work for the company you got to be able to say, how do I operationalize this in my field of influence? Yeah. Because you can't cata stuff you can't control. Yeah. Hmm. So then I want to ask one other question coming back to, you know, your role as a second coach or when someone's new yeah. to being a second coach, um, is there ever a role for a third coach yes. who's observing the second coach yes. at first? And do you ever ask somebody to be your third coach just to check in on you or help yes. tune up? Yes, coach. all of those, yes. So if I have a chance to uh, work with somebody and split the money, I will totally do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really fun to uh, have somebody second coach you. I did that with Health Rolick uh, most of the pandemic and was really, really fun because he had yeah. been one of my coaches. And then we started coaching together and I got to, ask him questions or say, you know, hey, Hal, you didn't ask this or you shouldn't have stopped and told that story. And Mm -hmm. this year, uh, Maria Grzynka and I are planning on uh, second coaching each other when we're we're not being paid to second coach each other. We're supposed to coach, but we're going to we're going to do the same thing. Both show up, take turns, split the money. It's also really great in a consulting role, because then if you need to go skiing for a week or you get sick, the other person <laughs> yeah. knows the people and they can just jump right in. And that's a real benefit, I think, on both sides. Sure. Um, Beth Carrington, I don't know if I can mention another great, yeah. <laughs> another great woman in lead. Yeah, please do. Beth Carrington has uh, produced a coaching card for second coaches. Um, at KGG, we have a, a coaching record for second coaches, like a, a reflection sheet. And I actually did a, a giant mind, mind dump uh, that I call the learning tracker uh, of a way to figure out what's going on with people at every level, learners, coaches, second coaches. And it really, a lot of it comes down to how much support do you need? Like we want everyone to do a good job, right? Everyone to be in that learning zone, everyone to be having a good experience there. Um, the question is, how much support do you need from your coach? How much support do you need from your second coach? And sometimes in a problem situation, um, they will call in a, somebody else to help or observe just to see what's going on. Yeah. One of my favorites that's really quick to tell, I don't know how much time we have, but it's a fun one that your, your, your audience might enjoy. So, we, um, so here in, in my part of British Columbia, maybe in the whole West, there is a lot of people who um, are kind of living in what my mom would have called a hippy dippy kind of world. So they, mm-hmm. the idea of 
um, science is really unusual to them. And we get, we come sometimes get lots of people who want to learn things. They've heard about it from their friends. So I had a call from a coach and a second coach who were stuck with a learner because the learner refused to predict what would happen as a result of her step or experiment. Mm. Because do you want to guess why? Fear of being wrong? No, no, no. Fear that they were manifesting it. That by saying it and writing it down would oh. actually make it happen. Mm. That the forces of the universe would mm. make this happen because they said it and wrote it down. And they're like, I don't know if I can teach science to somebody who thinks that speaking words <laughs> makes things happen. Yeah. So we got a, a third coach in and we talked about, you know, we usually talk about what are we, what did we all agree to do? What are the roles? One of the roles is you got to try this. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, um, you know, Trace, this has been a lot of fun. There's so much more we we could talk about. Maybe we can, <laughs> Fear of being you know, all powerful. Do, you know, you um, asked about the emotional bit. And I just want to say that... Um, uh, uh, there are sometimes tears at the cat board, but yeah. they're often emotionally like, like move. People are moved by yeah. what happens. More they of a release. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I keep yeah. Kleenex close at hand. It happens. Yeah. 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 Well, we can. Um, yeah. That's understandable. So, um, well, uh, talk a little bit, uh, you know, we, we, we could always, and maybe we, we can do an episode sometime with you and a couple, we can do a cotta girl geeks round table that would be so fun or um um tell, where where can oh, i can put a link in the show notes but just in terms of web addresses where where's the best place to go find uh, more information about kata girl geeks uh kata girl geeks has a placeholder website mm -hmm. uh and you can certainly okay so if you identify as a woman because mm -hmm. we're not we're not not inclusive but a lot of guys want to join yeah. um but we think that there's something about the all-female group that creates a safe learning environment and a nurturing mm -hmm. one, too. Sure. Um, uh, Category Geeks is probably easy to find on LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn okay. group, and we have a web page, and it's just info at Category Geeks. We'll get you right there. Um, I'm one of the founders, so we, yeah, I'm an easy connection, too. And uh, same with Cata School Cascadia. We are there, There's not like 10 things named that, so it's pretty easy to find us. We're a .org. Okay. Um, and my name, my, um, my mother was uh, pretty straightforward with spelling. So yes. there aren't too many people with exactly Tracy without an E and mm -hmm. uh, Defoe, like Daniel Defoe. So pretty easy to find. Okay. So instead of telling people the answers, people can go ask questions of Google. <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, you've got my contact info, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll put links in the show notes. And then the second thing, and maybe we, we can spend a couple of minutes on, I um, want to hear a little bit about, uh, you mentioned Tilo Schwartz earlier, the masterclass that, yes. that you're running with him. Tell us about that a little bit. Um, so I met Tilo Schwartz a while ago at, a, at, I don't know which catacomb it was, the one in Atlanta, I think. i never good with the numbers. And it we just chatted briefly and decided we had the same ultimate goal, which was that we think everybody would benefit from learning this kind of thinking. We could mm -hmm. get uh, you know, grounding, less stress, uh, that growth mindset. And so we kind of started talking about that. Tilo is like a really fantastic master coach. And he runs a course to, because he thinks that uh, the bottleneck is always coaches. Mm. It's never enough good coaches. You need more coaches. So, coach. so he's on a mission to create better coaches. And the master class uh, is an online course we do only twice a year. It's, uh, I think it's eight weeks and it's online. Uh, there's a, a lesson and then a practice and how it works is that I run the practice. So Tilo runs the lesson. I run the practice. So I always say it's good cop, bad cop. I'm the yeah. good one. And, <laughs> and um, the masterclass Tilo has a uh, exercises and things which are aimed at learning micro skills. So tiny little coaching skills that you can use when you need them. So you, yeah. we get together and practice them. It's uh, it comes from what he calls um, the coaching dojo. And uh, the dojo is also uh, a, a joke, a play on martial arts. So that's a place like a gym where you go right. to learn and practice. This morning, I had the fun. I was on a call for Cata Schools International and Jeff Liker uh, put in a plug for uh, the Cata coaching uh, books that are coming out. So there's uh, Tilo Schwartz and Jeff Liker have uh, banded together and are writing a novel 
Hmm. So, you know, you mentioned... Oh, it's like, it's like a graphic no, It's a graphic novel even, isn't it? No, no, this is a novel novel. Jeff oh. is doing a graphic novel about uh, Zingerman Mail Order. Oh, okay. Yeah? My comic, mistake. Which he called a comic book, but yes. Yeah. And, uh, and then this is an actual novel. Uh, if you've ever seen Tilo Schwartz, as he goes by um, catch, coaching Kata Dojo, but Tilo Schwartz is... Uh, blog for a while he was blogging as if he was in the head of a coach so it would be mm -hmm. like what were they thinking and what happened mm -hmm. and this was just a way he integrated the learning of these little skills into real life that has now been developed into a book mm -hmm. and Jeff Liker got on board for some of the writing of the story and uh, it's it's going to be out this year as a sort of like Andy and me you know mm -hmm. how Andy right. and me Pascal's takes, book yeah Pascal Dennis's book takes um the uh what is the what is it called? Something like um, uh, Lean Explained or oh Lean Lean Production Simplified is right. the that's the like the his, tool book his textbook and, if you will yeah yeah and then Andy and Me is like the the novel where you can see how this works walking around with human relations yeah so that's what they've done with um, this Cata Coaching Dojo book. Okay, well, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, Pascal, I've done episodes with him. I, I'm pretty sure about Andy and Me, and then he had a follow up Andy and Me in the hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. About bringing some of these ideas into healthcare. So I, I do, and I, I recommend Pascal's books um, a lot. So um, Me too. I used to use the the um, Lean Production Simplified and Andy and Me as textbooks when I taught Lean. Yep. All right. Well, we're, we're getting a lot of uh, sure. shout outs to, to good people here today that yeah, we've learned fun. and learned from and admire. So, hey, Pascal, and, and hi to the others we've mentioned. Where can people learn more uh, about that masterclass if they're interested in signing up? They, they can Google it. They can contact Ooh, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. That's a really good one. I think if you go to kata dojo, um, dot, kata, uh, hyphen dojo dot com, mm -hmm. the masterclass is one of the drop downs. I okay. had to hesitate because Tilo, I, I, you know, I, I love Tilo and he's fantastic but I tease him about his English all the time because I'm an old English teacher. <laughs> and he always says, um, kata minus dojo, like the mathematical <laughs> sign. So I had to stop my head and not say that. Kata-dojo.com. Masterclass in English or German is one of the drop downs. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. I hope people will check that out. So again, we've been joined um, today. Tracy, this has been a lot of fun. Um, oh, it's really fun. Thank you. Um, Tracy Defoe. Um, you can find her website at the Learning Factor. Um, dot ca and um you know i i've, I've enjoyed you know the, the opportunities when we've been in group calls and the chances to talk with you um, in different ways and i'm glad glad to have you on the podcast here today thank so you so again. much thank yeah. you i look forward to seeing it and or reading it hearing it whatever <laughs> i look forward to it yeah thanks a lot <laughs> thanks tracy <laughs> bye-bye